everybody. I'm Gail Rudolph with Lyft Leadership. Welcome to Learn with Lyft this morning. If you aren't able to be with us live right now, we will be posting this later so that you can actually see it. We are pleased today to have Don Yoder with us. Don is a good personal friend of mine and a, a great professional colleague. Don works for Global Priority Solutions out of Ohio. And um, one of her biggest passions and the things I love to talk to her about are generations and how things affect um, each generation. So she partners with us many, many times. And I want to turn it over to Dawn to talk to you a little bit today about, Dawn, how this is going to affect families and children and grandchildren, the shelter in place. Yeah, <laughs> the shelter in place. It's a little bit crazy, right, what we got going on right now. So different uh, climate than we've ever had. We've got new things happening, shelter, stay in place, you know, safe at home, stuck at home, <laughs> that whole thing. You're trying to have that good attitude for me too, is to have that good attitude about I'm not stuck at home, I'm safe at home. So that's my first, my first tip to everyone is if you are at home, um, I try to look at it as I get the privilege to be at home. Cause I've got a lot of people around me that are in different industries where either they're in healthcare or different things like that, where they're really on the front lines. And so, you know, my heart goes out to them and the anxiety that they deal with every day, you know, walking those situations. So I'm safe at home um, right now with my, I, um, I do love generations. I've worked in family business almost my whole life, like since I was a little kid, literally. Um, I always joke that for some people I have a farm. So when you're a kid on a farm, you learn how to work at the farm. Uh, for us, we had a business and our business was our farm. And so I spent every day at the office kind of learning about people and doing a myriad of jobs that you wouldn't have thought someone my age would have done. Um, but I did, and it was, it was really um, kind of sparked my curiosity into how generations work, because I would see different generations come in and what would happen even as a kid, because I had baby boomer parents. I'm a Gen Xer. Um, and then there would be, um, you know, my grandma worked with us, so my grandma would have been part of the builders. So even seeing how that worked together. So I'm just going to jump in a little bit, and I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk about some general things with generations and some communication tips. Um, I really, it's hard for me really to be on a on a call like this, you know, in a because I want to be with people so that we, I can see their face and know what they want to hear about and <laughs> help them. So if there's something that you think of that I can help you with, anybody that's on today that you want to ask questions or anything um, just that's kind of burning in the back of your brain that you're trying to address, let me know because I want to help you with those things. But um, basically, I'm going to start with why. Why do I think generations is important? Well. To understand people helps us to connect with people. And then we can build relationships and from those relationships come our influence. So in business and in my family, I think those are really important things. I have four children, my husband and I have four children. We've been married almost 30 years. And our children, I've got two millennials and I've got two Gen Z children. So I think it's really important for me to connect with them, to influence them. Um, I've been a CEO, I recently retired from that, um, but it was like a 500 person company. And so in that, I was dealing with lots of generations, lots of different personalities, all different things thrown in there. And I still work um, advising a, a resort and a club, health club and those kind of things and coaching and things. So connecting with people and having influence is really important to me. We have to expand our views of how people work and where they come from so that we can build that relationship and trust. And when we have that, we get peace and influence. Sometimes our conflict is about priorities and both sides can be right. Sometimes it's not about character. It may be a collision of styles and values. And so thinking about that, our conflict with styles and values, a lot of times that comes to generational things. So what makes a generation? Well, three things that I want you to remember. It's parents, politics, and pop culture. Those are our three things that make up how we work. You know, now I know those are generalities and we're all different people and maybe some of us were one generation raised by a grandma or something. So we've got some different influences, but the politics and the pop culture going on around us are pretty much stay the same for whatever generation we're in, right? Our parents can differ. Those things are not going to differ as much. And I don't want to stereotype people or try to pigeonhole people. It's just to give us this overall understanding of generational shifts. And that how sometimes these things that seem really sudden, like, where did that come from? Well, it's really been decades in the making because we have these generational shifts that happen. To me, I look at it like if there's a stream coming down a mountain. So this stream is coming down the mountain and over time, the weather and things that happen, the rocks shift. 
as the rocks shift, the stream moves. And so I look at it like that. So it's parents, politics, and pop culture. Um, yes, we're all unique. I'm not saying we're all the same. Some of these things I might talk about, you might say, oh my goodness, yes, I identify with that. And other things you may not identify with at all. And that's okay, because you're an individual. This is just generality to understand. So, um, so what are those things? Parenting styles, world events, educational shifts, financial climate, faith, global exposure, all those things contribute to how we think, what we value, how we communicate, just even the development of technology over the decades changes a lot of all of those things, how we think, how we communicate, um, how we get our information, how we put our information to work, what we value, what we see happening, all those things work with it. So let me go through, what are our generations? Well, I talked about my grandma, who's been now passed, but that would be the builders. So the builders would be born between 1925 and 1945. The boomers, that's my parents. My parents, um, that's 1946 to, no, 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 where'd they go? Oh, 1946 to 1964. Then Generation X, that's what I'm part of, is 1965 to 1979. The millennials are 1980 to 1996. And again, these are loosely defined. You cross over, there's micro generations. There's so much stuff. We could spend a couple days on this. We only got like 20 minutes. So we're gonna cover quick. Um, Generation Z is 1997 and they're kind of still determining the cutoff point. Um, some say 2012, others will say 2010 is the cutoff point for that. And then Generation Alpha is our 2010 to 12 and underneath that. So those are the generations that we're thinking about and that's a lot of different people and that's a lot of different ages. So a few things that we will discuss about a, a builder. A builder, um, I like to have an I am statement. That makes it easier for me to kind of associate. So for my builders, it's I am as good as my word, you know, a, a handshake. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a saver. Work is a privilege. I work to survive. Like you gotta think this is back in the world wars. Um, Great Depression or slightly after era. So you're looking at people where work was a privilege and they were working to survive. They wanted a better life for their children. They were building society to sustain the future for their children. So they weren't overly, they didn't go to every baseball game. They didn't hit all their activities. And it wasn't because they didn't care. It was because they cared, but they felt the ramifications of work not being a certainty. So now it was, I'm working to establish their future. Um, so what are our communication tips? We're going to cut straight to that. Our communication tips, one-on-one, -on -one, make eye contact, which is really tough right now, especially if they're in nursing care facilities and things like that. How do we do that? I've seen some inventive people. I mean, Zoom, this is great. You know, get on calls with people and things. But that can be really tough. I mean, I remember my grandma, end of her life, she was picking up the remote control thinking it was the phone. So this is a tough place for them to be. So I've seen a lot of people taking those steps to like go to the window, you know, make, you know, get to the window, get to the door so you can talk to them through the window, things like that. Sometimes it's the best we can do. It's really sad that they're in this place right now where we're not able to connect the way that we would have before. But um, ask questions and listen closely to them. Uh, they definitely prefer more formal communication, traditional protocols, all that kind of thing. They value expertise and experience and respect those who follow suit. So I think that's important as we're navigating these really crazy times with COVID and all this kind of stuff. Understand that they are going to take most of their cues from the news, no matter if we agree with that or not, because those were the trusted people in their days and that's who they have contact with still right now. So that's where they're at. Uh, proof points are important. You need to prove that there is a need for something new. So that need for I can't see you, they have to have the proof points for that. And a lot of times that comes through the news and some of the different things are going on. You can draw your own conclusions from that. And they hold privacy in high esteem. Discretion is really important. They like to have their information protected, or at least they perceive that it's protected. So that's why they can get really crazy about, you know, their things at the end of their life and their bank accounts in there because that privacy is super important to them. So respect that. So that's our builders. Our baby boomers are 1946 to 1964, and their I am statement is, I am what I do. Uh, I live to work. That's their work preference. So we've got the, um, the builders work to survive. The boomers live to work. So it's our work shift. Uh, the 80s, the, a lot of them came professional things in the 80s. It was the me decade. And they, the me decade was the, when we changed from we the people to me the person. So that's a huge shift in the United States for how we think and how we do things. Before that, it was always about what was good for the, the greater good, all those military 
you know, drives to save things and donate things and all those things. Then it became me, the person. So we had this individualism that shifted. Um, and then you have to think about now that we're in this thing of social distancing and listening to the government and some of our individual things are being a little more challenged. How is this going to affect how we approach things? It could be really different. So here's our communication tips. Um, we want to make sure that they feel respected and appreciated. So that's really important to that generation because that's how they understand that they're valued. So body language is important. Put down your device and look them in the eye, which I think is hilarious because my parents don't always do that, but they appreciate when I do. Um, they prefer face-to-face -face conversations to be shown how to do things, to speak in an open and direct style and to avoid controlling language. So they don't want to be trapped into something. So, you know, sometimes that selling thing where it's like, well, if I want to convince them, then I'll, you know, you say yes three times and you can't say no, doesn't work so well. They get a little irritated with that. Um, they like to see flexibility in our thinking and want details to show that we've thought it through. So don't just give one solution, present three solutions and the reason why for all of them. That really helps. Use emotional images that play to their sense of family, their, whatever their values are. And remember, they're spending a lot of time on the internet right now. So if you want to reach them, that's a good place to do it. And yes, it's usually going to be something like Facebook, but wherever they're at is where we need to find them. So Generation X, uh, we're the adapters. That's me. I am all things to all people. That's my I am statement. I'm all things to all people, or I like to go back to the I'm every woman, right? So that's where we're coming from. Uh, we're into work-life balance. So our work shifted again to work-life balance now from I live to work. Uh, communication tips. One thing with Generation X is do not overlook them. So much has been focused on the parents before them and now the demographic after them, the millennials, that they feel like they've been forgotten. So just remember that they're there. Share information on a regular basis. Um, this group loves information, so try to keep them in the loop. Give them regular feedback. Um, they're going to use that to adapt to new situations, and they like the email. So communication tips for Generation X, you know, basically they want to be up front, they want to be included, they don't want to be forgotten. Millennials, that's I am my recognition. These are working to live. So my I am statement, I'm my recognition, notice me, and I am working to live. So you can see where that conflict can come. We've got boomers who live to work and now with one generation separated, we've come to um, work to live. So it's a whole different thing. Uh, so here's our things with millennials. They like small goals with tight deadlines. So keep that in mind. Uh, you want to be confident with them, allow them to challenge ideas. That's what being confident is. It's not overrunning them. It's allow them to give ideas, express the desire to listen. This is a real important one. Acknowledge their experience before you reference your own. Hear them out first. If they can get out what's on their brain, then they're going to be easier to listen to you. So let them get theirs out first. Don't talk down to them. Okay. They like action words and they like to be challenged, but they don't like to be talked down to. Give and ask for lots of feedback. Ask them what they think. Give them positive feedback. I, so when I say give feedback, give way more positive than critical. Okay. You want to give them something to lift them up. Ask for lots of feedback. Listen to what they have to say. Communicate clearly and specifically. So give your details on the front end, not after they didn't do what you wanted. So I want to give a real quick little story here because all these details can get boring. So quick story. There was a study done in Canada in a, in a university setting with graduate students. They used three different groups of people. There was Canadians, um, there were uh, Europeans, there were Asians. So three different, they were from different parts. You know, Canada is such a melting pot. So all different areas of the world. And they did this study where in the beginning of the classes, they gave the students lots of details, like their syllabus was crammed full of details. It was, you know, everything they wanted done, exactly when they wanted it done, exactly how they wanted it done. And then as the semester went on, they started pulling the details away. So they would pull away little things that they were used to having. And what they found was that as they pulled those away, anxiety climbed and productivity diminished. So keep, keep this in mind. And this has stayed true, I think, as we've gone through from millennials to Generation Z, we're still seeing the same thing. They're getting a lot of information up front in their classes, in their school. And when they come into a company or into a situation with family where all of those things aren't expressed, you know, all of those details aren't given or how you want things to look in the end isn't given up front, it's very frustrating and demoralizing for them. So I want you to really take that in. Um, because for me, I kind of have, you know, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. I told you that I'm kind of like, okay, well, let's get it started and then we can shape it as we go. This is super frustrating to a millennial or to a Gen Z. 
because that's not what they're used to. And they feel micromanaged when you do that. When you want to shape as they go, they feel micromanaged. Such a hard thing for me to overcome with people, you know, where I'm trying to figure out how do I do this? It requires more time and more thought on the front end, but the results that it produces are so much better. So if you can get yourself to say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to really focus in on what I want on the front end instead of shaping as we go, see how that can improve your relationships. It can make a huge difference. Uh, they like informal communication. Um, we should embrace roles like mentoring, counseling, advocating, sponsoring, any of those things. They're looking for someone to be their Yoda. Okay, so if you're familiar with Star Wars, which I'm a big Star Wars geek, but they want someone to be their mentor, not to be the hero of the story. They want to be the hero of the story. So yeah. if you can be the Yoda, if you can walk in enough humility that you can allow that to happen and you can sew into them and let them be the hero of the story, you're going to have much better results. Uh, be willing to adapt. This is another important thing. You have to understand, so I've explained really quickly, I know, but parents, politics, pop culture makes a huge difference in how we see things. So with that in mind, you're going to figure out pretty quickly that a millennial or a Gen Z is going to have a different frame of reference than what you have. So it's really important to suspend the bias of your own experience to try to see things through their lens. It's called empathy. But that's what we need to do. It's not ascribing to what they're saying. It's not saying we believe exactly the same thing. I'm on the same page as you, but just suspending long enough to really understand where they're at. If you can do that and you can let them get their piece out first, then you're gonna have a lot more success having influence with whatever you have to add. So I've noticed like with my, my millennial sons, you know, they call me with a problem and I really work hard to get myself to show restraint. And when they call the problem, to say first, well, what do you think you should do? Instead of me just saying what I think they should do. I think that makes a huge difference. So that's one thing that I really work hard to do with them. Um, we want to help them to, yes. Just real quick. So mm -hmm. the thing that I've noticed, it seems to me that there is a, I mean, and I know there's always whatever generation you're in, you kind of don't understand every, you know, the other generations a little bit. Oh, their music. Oh, they're whatever. Yeah. Why does it seem that there's such a divide between, it seems to be baby boomers and millennials. I mean, you see stuff going all around all the time and they're always, you know, throwing sand in the sandbox specifically, it seems like at each other. Is there a particular reason why this is? I think it's because their philosophies are 180 different. Okay. So they're one, it's, and it's crazy too, because, um, you know, we didn't see that in the past. Cause if you look at like, I look at my generation, generation X versus say the builders. I never, like my grandma was my grandma and she was old, but I would never like really disrespect her. Right. Or, like you said, throw sand and you know, I wouldn't yeah. do that. Right. Um, but I think it's because it's such a, both sets of people feel disrespected. And I think that's where it all stems from. Yeah. The baby boomers took after that builder philosophy where you respect your elders. The millennials go more, their philosophy sits more in respect the person who can get it done. Okay. So like one of the things I've given an example of before is that like a call center, I remember like I always worked in a call center and when somebody would call in, they'd say, let me speak to your boss. And I knew I was a baby boomer. They wanted the authority. Now when a millennial calls in to get help with somebody, they just want someone who can help them. They don't care if it's the owner of the company. And so those are some things. And when I talked about that first thing, when I said, you have to see the 180 between work to live and live to work, like that's where it starts at. Because yeah. that I am what I do, my I am statement for a boomer is this is who I am, what I do. And then for the millennial to come back on the other side of it and say, that's not who I am. Who I am is all of these things. Right. It's not just what I do. Right. And so you've got these opposing things and then this lack of respect and some of the, you know, it's just, it just kind of starts to unravel. And I really yeah. think, cause you're right. And they're, I mean, my kids joke around with me and they're like, I'm not even a boomer, but I'll say something like, okay, boomer. I'm sure right. we've all heard that. Right. This right. Hashtag, but you know, it's one of those things where it, it's kind of a joke and it kind of isn't because it's actually hurtful. And that's why I think it's really important to empower people to relate and so that's why I focus a lot of my attention on millennial and generation Z, because really it's up to people with more maturity to reach back and say, okay, let me figure out how to relate to you. 
Um, if we're expecting younger generations to figure out how to relate to us, um, that's called entitlement. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it doesn't work too well. And I know that's how it always used to be, but that isn't how it is now. And some of it has even, like you said, why the big difference and why has it, why does the shift feel so hard? Some of it's just population demographics because yeah. the, the um, generation in between the boomers and the, and the um, millennials is a smaller generation. So the, the Gen X is just smaller, it's less years. So it's smaller, the shift was quicker. And so just because of the sheer numbers of it, there wasn't as much of a cushion. There wasn't a natural, it was more like Gen X is also adapters. So they kind of adapted to how builders do things or boomers do things, even if that wasn't what they wanted to do because there just wasn't enough numbers to influence the, the shift, you know, the tipping point. But when you enter millennials, you've got a bigger generation and now you've got enough to push the tipping point and then you have people pushing back. Right. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, and I think that's true. And I think you're right that those kind of um, opposing or polar opposite self-identity where it's like, oh, you know, I identify myself by my job and what I, what I do for, you know, and, and millennials definitely don't do that. And I, and it's just kind of disconcerting. I see a lot of that, like I said, sand throwing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like if we would all just step back and say, you know what, look, this is, this is where I'm coming from. This is my story. This is my perspective. Share yours with me. It doesn't mean I really agree with it, but help me understand. And it just seems like, especially in this environment too, and we just need that more. Um, but moving on, I have another question for you because I have a, a friend who has a daughter, young, 10. Um, and so there's a lot of things, and I know a lot of other people, I have people who have seniors in high school and a lot of stuff that's, you know, their lives are really being disrupted. Mm -hmm. um, and at least somebody who's maybe 18 years old can kind of get a better grasp on this um but younger kids like how do you i mean i kind of see that some of this stuff is um gonna maybe leave an indelible mark on them emotionally psychologically and so my my particular friend her daughter has now started exhibiting external signs of stress that she's internalizing like pulling her hair out mm -hmm. um so how would you say you know if you and i and my friend's really good about you know trying to connect with her and stuff, but do you have any, you know, any suggestions on how we as parents, um, you know, can talk to our kids and how do we kind of, you know, maybe tamp down their fears and their stress level a little bit? Because, you know, this is hard for a lot yeah. of people and is really upended you know, for seniors, no graduations, no, like, this is like what they've been working for. And, you know, I mean, and little kids too. So, yeah. no, I, it is something that's, <laughs> cause I'm living in that world too. So yeah. I have a 16 year old daughter who just, you know, missed out on cheering for state championships for their high school basketball teams, right. who missed out on state choir competitions, who's missing out on taking part of graduation with her friends that are graduating, not seeing her friends at school, you know, all those things. And um, also with uh, specifically with Generation Z, they are very high anxiety. We see rates of anxiety climbing. It, yeah. it's, it's unprecedented. And we also see rates of attempted suicide and suicide also climbing unprecedented. And so it's like, everybody's like, well, why, why, why? And what can we do? And there's a lot of good information out there. I'll share a few things with you real quick. Um, one thing that, that, out, that external display of the internal anxiety is getting really common. That's why you see, we, and we go through waves of it. We see waves of cutting that goes through school systems. We see waves of suicide that goes through school systems or attempted um, pulling out the hair. Um, I've seen kids that do, they scratch themselves. They dig, they maybe didn't use a knife to cut, but they'll dig at something or they get itchy, physically itchy from the internal and they start to scratch and they get wounds from it. I see that happen quite a bit. Um, because one of the other things that I do is I work, I'm on a board and I work with developing curriculum for students, for junior high and high school students that's based around values and helping them learn how to make decisions and cope with things around them. And so a lot of that we see with the younger generation, they really need some help with dealing with their setting boundaries. That's a big part of it. Helping kids set boundaries um, is a big part of alleviating anxiety and then helping them grow their resilience. So those are big, big, big parts of that. But here's some specifics. Um, my very first suggestion is, that when we're leading or parenting people right now, and no matter if they're kids or they're adults, 
anytime that we're in a leadership role, we have any kind of influence of authority, especially today, we need to lead from wisdom and not from fear. And that's a big part of it. If kids or even our employees, people that are influenced by us, hear panic in our voice, that is going to make them feel more panicked. It was really interesting to me. Um, we were on a family Zoom call last week. And so my family, it was all generations. It was my whole family. So I've got two siblings. They're both married. We've got everything from alpha to millennials for the grandkids. And so we're all on this call. And um, like my son lives in Japan right now. So that freaks me out a little bit. Um, and so we're all on the call together. And my dad and I worked before the call to write out some questions to send to everybody. And it was like, just answer, just whatever. You can, you can pick one if you want. But it was different questions. And one of the ones that we asked is, what is the hardest thing for you right now or the biggest disappointment? Hmm. And I really expected my daughter, who just turned 16, to talk about missing school, missing events, missing. That's what I expected her to say. Right. And I was really shocked because what she said is, the hardest thing is that adults don't know what to do. So you have to understand that their security, their base is pulled out from underneath them right now because we're all navigating waters that we've never been through before. And so that really hit me hard because I was expecting a much more, I don't want to say shallow answer, but something that I felt would be more appropriate to her world, you know? And when she said that the biggest thing is that adults don't know what to do, I was like, whoa. So I think that's a big part of even talking about your friend with the 10 year old. I think that's a big part of that is feeling from all different places, even if the adult in their life, the parent is exhibiting calm and reassurance. There's so much out there with social media, the news, all the you know, addresses that happen, all the things that sometimes we don't even realize kids are taking in. Yeah. And they are like, <laughs> I laugh with my mom, but I was sending songs to my old, to my old friend back and forth from the seventies, just as a fun thing to, she lives in California. I live in Ohio just to break up our monotony. And I thought of a song by the Juby brothers. And I remember this album cover they had that when you opened it up, they were all kind of not very clothed inside. <laughs> and I told my mom, we laughed about it. Cause I, I was making jokes about what I thought when I was a kid about it and everything. And I was talking to my mom about it. She's like, Oh my gosh, I was a terrible mother. I'm like, no, you weren't. It's like, I just didn't realize you would have seen any of that. Like that would have been of interest to you at five. Right. And so right. what I, what that woke me up to is there's so much going on that I maybe don't have an awareness for what my child is taking in. Yeah. And to understand that that's why boundaries are important and asking lots of questions about their day and who they're talking to and how are your friends doing and what are your friends talking about yeah. and to try to get that. And if you can get them to open up about that, then they're not isolated. See, isolation causes that anxiety to climb. You can be in the same room with someone and still be isolated. Yeah. So helping people to get in touch with their emotions and to express them, you know, emotions are way harder to say they're so much scarier when they're unsaid than when they're said. And so if you can get them to say those emotions, it doesn't, they think it's going to make them feel worse. It doesn't, it makes them feel better. But I mean, even as an adult, I tend to do that, right? You go into that whole pattern where I'm trying to get myself, you know, focus on something else to get no matter, even if it's work or whatever it is to disengage from what I'm afraid of. And so that's what happens. They are trying to disengage, you know, trying to fill that space with, binge watching walking dead or you know whatever they're into but they playing animal crossing which just came out last week and i see a lot of so you know they're doing those kind of things and i'm not saying those things are bad they're only bad when they keep you from acknowledging what's going on on the inside and what you need to get out so that's another thing so that's almost like a form of self-medication that kids do right absolutely. like we as adults use other things alcohol or whatever absolutely and that's what kids are doing too right so yeah. they're internalizing all of these things and you can see that they're reacting to it by some of their physical you know um you know yeah what's like coming out right the they're shut down. down they start yeah. doing things physically they go to their room and shut the door they never come out yeah. you know all those things that happen generation z my i am statement for them is i am my likes and it, which is different mm -hmm. than recognition because likes are you know whatever happens on instagram or right. mainly instagram and snapchat so when those things happen right now the likes release dopamine in their brain so they're looking for that dopamine fill, that fix. So we might get it from cigarettes or alcohol or chocolate, if you're me. And so, caffeine, yeah. you know, all those things. And so with, with kids, though, it's their likes. And so that puts them very dependent on social media right now when they need a feel-good fix. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, but actually the more time they spend there, the more tired they get, the more overwhelmed they become. Yeah. Um, and all the, the things that happen there, they actually become less resilient to what's going on around them. So it's important to help them set healthy boundaries, to get them to communicate, to ask them real questions and to communicate back to them in a real way, like with facts. Yeah. They want to hear the facts. They right. don't want to hear the hype that makes them scared. Um, you know, it's, it's like what I, what I talked about that leading from wisdom rather than fear is that difference between telling a kid, Hey, don't go out in the street. You're going to get hit by a car or saying, okay, make sure you look both ways to make sure there's no cars coming. So we need to take that second approach where we're putting water on the fire, not gas on the fire. So it's like, yes, we're going to be wise. We're staying in to be wise. Even if you got the virus, I think you would be okay. But we're going to stay in to be wise and to respect the authority of the people around us, like the medical authorities and the government authorities that are trying to contain and find a cure so that we can get caught up. So speaking those facts to keep them calm is really good. Um, other things that we can do to help them is just to connect with them at home, um, to help them by, um, by making them a part of solutions in our home. So that may be with meals, grocery lists, uh, cleaning things, projects in the home, anything we can do, crafts, anything we can do to make them a part of what an activity is. So it's not the activity or, you know, it's just them having the idea. What would you like to do? Or if they don't have an idea, how can I help you be creative and ingenuity? You know, and so how can I help them with that? Right. Uh, to write down hopes and dreams. That's a big thing because right now we kind of quit hoping and dreaming. So then if it's a bucket list, family things we want to do when this is over, whatever those things are, things that we can anticipate. So I was reading something by James Clear last week that I thought was really good. He was talking about the difference between anticipating and expecting and how anticipating makes us exciting for the future, but we're not trying to control it. And when we expect, we're trying to predict the future and restrict the happiness to one thing. So try to come up with hopes and dreams of things that we can anticipate, but not put a time limit on them of when to expect. Because right now that could just make it worse. Right. We want to make it better. Um, right. We want to be excited about the possibilities, but not entitled to them. So that's important. Uh, reminisce together. My, my kids love to look at old pictures, family videos, talk about fun things we've done, fun times we've had, something to lighten that mood. Anything we, any way we can laugh, funny movies, shows. I mean, I've been watching old Saturday Night Live YouTube videos with my daughter because she didn't even know Jimmy Fallon was on Saturday Night Live, you know? So it's like we've been watching things just to kind of lighten those moods and, and have fun together. I mean, we'll have crazy dance night. We did. We were all trying to do the Napoleon Dynamite dance last night in my living room. And it was hilarious because my husband is not a good dancer, but we were having a lot of fun with it. So things that can lighten the mood is really good. Make sure that you're eating meals together, create discussion topics, use cards, talk about what's one hope you have. I mean, whatever those are, there's lots of those things available online, but anything that's going to help them to connect in that way. One thing that when I was talking with Gail that she actually suggested is maybe you want to do disc profiles. You know, there's free ones online. Go do personality tests together. Explore who are we and talk about it and laugh about it and all those things. Those can be things that really help you get to know each other and connect. Right. Um, but I just think the biggest thing is to parent and lead out of wisdom and not fear. I really think that's the number one most important thing and then yeah. help them set those boundaries and get them to talk. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. You're muted, Gail. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. So I want to open it up to anybody who might have questions for Dawn. Does anybody have a question? Just make sure you're unmuted. Dawn, I have one for you. One okay. of the things that, and, and other people might have it also, is as we talk through generations, and you're a generation expert, so you can come help, I mean, they can contract you through us, and we'll do a whole workshop on this, but if you had to sum it up, and, and I know it's going to be hard for you, <laughs> in <laughs> now. one sentence, how can we help break down um, this communication gap and barrier amongst the generations? Just um, that, that fits all generations. How, how could we help we personally to remember as we go out every day to break them down? Okay, so there are a couple things that really apply to every generation. One is look for and call out the greatness in each other. When we do that, we really help people to be the, mo the best they can be. And when they feel like our heart is for them, it doesn't now, a millennial needs that, but a boomer still loves that. Yeah. So if we can look for and call out the greatness in each other and help lift each other up, that's number one. Number two 
is to be empathetic. If we can suspend the bias of our own experience and really listen to somebody else without having to judge it, without having to jump in and change their mind, without getting afraid because their views conflict with ours and we're afraid of what the world might become if we let them talk, if we can do that, we can bring that respect because respect is really important. So we've got empathy, respect, those are two things. <laughs> those are both really important to respect each other's viewpoints. And then the way that we can include people is to identify things that we have in common. What do we all see the same way? That's why, Gail, I know one of the things that you do is you work with round tables and values and that kind of thing too. And when we are able to assemble around a common value, we figure out what we have in common instead of what we don't have different. Like, why do we all think honesty is important? Well, it all affects, affects all of us positively. Why is respect good? Well, we all want to be respected. You know, why is it important to be responsible? Well, we all enjoy when the people around us are responsible. So those are the things that we can connect on and, and agree on. And when we start to agree on those things, a couple things happen. One, we start to see people as real people and not cartoons. Like you talked about, um, Kristen, that, you know, the generations, why they throw sand and okay, boomer and, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Well, we need to see them as real people and not just the cartoon people. And so in order to do, it's so much easier to get on our soapbox with a cartoon person, right? It's so much easier to throw sand at people when they are not real, when they don't have real feelings, when they're just you know stupid or whatever we wanna say. So if we can help to see people as they really are, and the one way to do that is to connect an environment where we're talking about something that's not explosive, where people can express themselves and where we can hear and listen really important, value opinions, and allow them to come up with revelation and a step for growth. So that's why a roundtable works so great for that stuff to happen. I know you've got information on those, but that's really helpful too. Um, but I think those are the most important things. Empathy, respect, you know, listening, suspending the bias, having our heart before somebody else. I mean, those are things when we put people, other people before ourselves, and when we can really respect them and want to see the best happen for them when our hearts for them, then everybody's allowed to shine. And I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah. How about other questions? Does anybody else have questions for Don? I have, I don't know this, the question, if you could just respond to this scenario that I heard. This was years ago, probably 10 years ago. So before the current generation, I guess maybe, um, in the workplace. And I was at a workshop on generational issues and dealing with people of different generations. A, a woman who was my age, Boomer, was talking about uh, facilitating a meeting at work in which there were several of the younger generation involved. And during the course of the meeting, she said, she got a text on her phone from one of the participants in the meeting saying they didn't agree with what the last person had just said. Is that representative or is that just a very unique individual who has a hard time speaking up? <laughs> no, I think it's kind of, I mean, I don't want to, there are people who are not afraid to confront from every generation, yeah. but in general, younger generations do struggle more with confrontation. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason why it's important to have those those conversations about confrontation and healthy confrontation so that they understand that just because you want to speak a different opinion, they feel vulnerable, they feel exposed, and there's a real fear of being judgmental, yeah. you know, because we're like, don't judge, don't judge. And so they feel like if they offer up a differing opinion, it's putting them in the hot seat to be criticized, and it's, it's tough. So I don't, I think that's actually pretty, not as unusual as we might hope it would be to get a text on something like that. I mean, I've sat in places with the same kind of situations with employees and had them text me during meetings. My daughter, I've had her text me during conversations with other people, and she's texting me while she's sitting next to me something that she's afraid to say out loud. So <laughs> I think it's not as, but, but here's the thing is that gives us an opportunity though, if you're that person that sat there, it gives you the opportunity to go talk to that person because they reached out to you and texted you. It gives you the opportunity to sit down in a very non-confrontational type way and just say, hey, I just wondered why, why you thought you couldn't say something. Why, why did you feel that way? You know, you know, like I value what you have to say. I think other people could too. You know, those are the things that you want to try to encourage out of them to help them learn how to speak their mind in a respectful way. 
But I'm hearing you suggest to do that outside the meeting instead of going, does anyone else have something to say? I wouldn't call directly on and say, Dylan, is, do you have something to say about this? Nope. <laughs> window to, in a general way to give them an opportunity to say something? I wouldn't. <laughs> Okay. I wouldn't. And the reason why is even though that's my nature, what you just said, that is so my nature to say, hey, you know, I want to give them a chance. They don't feel like, like I'll give them the chance. I'll open the door for them. But for that person who texted you, there is a very good chance that what happens is now they feel unsafe with you mm -hmm. because you called them out and now they won't confide in you when they have something that they're struggling with. And that's the last thing you want. So I would prefer to take the longer solution and say, get apart with them and talk to them. And then ask them, say, hey, in the future, if that happens, would you like for me to open the door for you to say something? And that way you still establish trust and, and you can, but it gives them the chance to start thinking about, hmm, and say, hey, I'm not gonna call you out and make you uncomfortable because I don't wanna put you in that place, but I do wanna help you grow into the confidence that you feel like you can do that. And so then again, we've expressed my heart is for you. I'm with you on this, but we haven't put them into this place where it's like, you know, one or the other, because if they're put into one or the other, they're going to go with where they're most comfortable normally. And that's going to be not what you wanted. <laughs> so we're getting close to ending our time together. It's hard to believe um, when we get started talking about this, but Don, you talked about a couple of things. Um, I'm putting up uh, the, um, email info at lift-leadership.com. If you have additional questions, we can do that. Dawn also talked about a round table that you can actually do. Uh, that's free, free to you. And uh, if you wanna reach out, we'll get that to you and teach you how to do that with your family, your work colleagues, um, does wonders for culture and um, just just is amazing. I do it in the corporate setting and, and you know, I, I say, if nothing else, what you get is a clear definition because when I say I want to be respected more and when you say you want to be respected more, they can mean two completely opposite different things and it can bring everybody together and it's a great time right now to grow. So there are pro there is a program available to you. We can get that to you. Send us an email at info at lift-leadership.com. And Dawn, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Dawn's part of our team. If you want her to come out at some point in time, uh, get in contact with us. And um, any last words before we say goodbye for this morning? I just want to say thank you to you guys for letting me be on your call and just for the questions I got. And I'm just really grateful to you for including me. And it's just so nice to see you all. <laughs> Other people. Yay! Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Don, we, I personally just love working with you. We uh, we hit it off from the very beginning and it hasn't stopped. <laughs> love you. Yeah. Yeah, we really appreciate your insights. It's nice to talk to somebody who, who understands kind of all the generations because I do think we each kind of get into our own, you know, this is how I work. Why doesn't somebody else think like this, act like this, communicate like this? And you have to step outside yourself and understand everybody's got you know, a little bit of a different way of approaching and thinking things. And just like you said, asking questions and listening and setting aside what you believe and not thinking that's 100% right because your perspective is your perspective and everybody else has their own. And I think that's something that's just, we need to take that always. I mean, now even more so because we're all going through something in our, in, in internalizing it or it's manifesting in different ways. And, you know, however we can come together right now is really important so yeah and I know today we did focus more on like the relational aspect of things but if anybody ever has questions I mean you can contact me through through Lyft um, but there's also some trainings that we do I do on helping you to figure out how to hire how to train the next generation how to keep those people at work in your businesses you know those are all things that go along with it because there's these these principles that are the same, but sometimes the application of them can be difficult. And we need a little bit of help to figure out, okay, I understand they're like this, how do I apply that? I thought the question um, that the gentleman asked about you know, the meeting was a great, great question. And that's a reason, like that's, that's how you kind of incorporate in the business world of how do, we, how do we hire, how do we train, how do we retain people? So that's another direction we can go with this as well. 
So hi, Don. I'm Jim. <laughs> hey, Jim. <laughs> sorry, my name is my wife. <laughs> I, know, sorry. I, didn't I didn't think know. your name was Megan. That's why I didn't say. <laughs> I, I just wanted to summarize too for me as the father of an almost 21 year old. It does help to be reminded that some of the things he does that I might roll my eyes at are generational, not just personal. <laughs> that he's just, he's not off the rail on his own. He's, he's, he's representing his generation really well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It can be a big challenge. Last summer I had my son and his fiance lived with us for the summer while they were co oh. out of college. They were working through the summer and they both lived in the house. And it was interesting because not only did I have my son who I'm used to, but then I had his fiance, which is a whole different, another, different and very typical of Generation Z. And so, and I love her dearly, but it was like, okay, I had to make some adjustments. And I learned a lot through that. So it was a good experience, but it can be a challenge. Even though I know stuff, I still have to work to apply. So <laughs> I know it, but I'm like, oh wait, I already know I'm supposed to do that. Why am I doing this? <laughs> well, that's rough. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today on Learn With Lift. Thank you again, Don, for uh, your help. Love you um, and can't wait to see you hopefully soon in person. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day and stay healthy.